Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for all our leaders and pastors and workers and members. We pray, Lord, the entrance of your word will bring light to everyone in Jesus' name. Bless your people. Reverse every negative thing. Let your blessing abide in every heart. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Yeah. We're opening our Bibles to First Chronicles chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 1. And David consulted with the captains of thousands and hundreds and with every leader. And David said unto all the congregation of Israel, If it seem good unto you, and that it be of the Lord our God, let us send abroad unto our brethren everywhere that are led in all the land of Israel, and with them also to the priest and Levites which are in their cities and their suburbs that they may gather themselves unto us and let us bring again the ark of our God to us for we inquired not at it in the days of Saul and all the congregations said that they would do so for the thing was right in the eyes of all the people in verse 7 and they carried the ark of God in a new cart out of the house of Abinadab and Uzzah and Ahio drove the cart David and all Israel pledged before God with all their might and were singing with harps and with sceptres and with timbrels and with cymbals and with trumpets. And when they came unto the threshing floor of Zidon, Uzza put forth the sand to hold the ark for the oxen stumbled, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and he smote him, because he put forth his son to the ark, and there he died before God. As we look at the scriptures today, we need to understand how important the ark was in the midst of the children of Israel. It was actually the presence of God with them. It found out the way they ought to go. And it also divided the sea before them, like River Jordan. And blessings came to them. Peace, or the presence of God represented in the ark. The prosperity that came to them all because of that representation of the presence of the Lord. And anywhere they went, sometimes they went to the battlefield and they carried the ark with them. Sometimes they will want to walk around Jericho so that the walls of Jericho will fall down on their behalf. They carried the ark. And so, as we are thinking about the power of God, and you're thinking about the presence of God, and you're thinking about the progress that the children of Israel ought to make, it was regarded as very important that they'll take the ark with them. But God had prescribed, God had ordained, God had commanded the way the ark should be born, should be carried from place to place. As the ark was made, there were rings around the edges. And there were staves like long sticks, very strong, covered with gold, in those rings. And then the leapers will carry, they won't touch the ark, but they'll carry that ark on their shoulders. But at this time now, 
They forgot the commandment of God. God's command on who should carry the ark, they forgot that. God's command on how they should carry the ark, they forgot that too. But those things have been written and given many years before. Since the time of Moses, we need to understand that time does not change God's word. Has he given us a prescription? Has he given us a law? Has he given us a direction in which world to go? Time does not change God's word. Kings and princes, human authorities and religious personalities cannot change, they do not change the word of God. Who's uh, might have had good intention but you see the foundation was wrong if they were carrying the ark the way god commanded them to carry the ark there would be no stumbling but because they put it on a cart and they were driving that ark they were driving the animals that drew the cart that's why eventually it stumbled we must check up a foundation the foundation of our salvation, the foundation of our service, the foundation of our endeavors, the foundation of everything we do. If it's wrong at the foundation, something could happen that will be similar to the stumbling of the cart, that will be similar to the possibility of that ark falling down. And so, with that good intention of Uzzah, he put forth a sign to steal the ark, to steady the ark, so that it will not fall. And eventually, he was severely punished for his sin. The people that would like to call that a mistake, God called it sin. Other people would like to call it, you know, just a misdeed. And he had good intention. And we should overlook that. God did not overlook that. And he's calling us to learn our lesson before it becomes too late. The man died, but that's not the end of life. After death, there's no repentance. After death, there's something that comes. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 27. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. It is appointed unto men wants to die. Somebody could die in the Lord, in obedience to the Lord, holiness to the Lord, righteousness in the Lord. After that, there is the examination of everything he has done in the Lord. Somebody could die too, like Uzza, under the anger of the Lord. And then after dying under the anger of the Lord, there is no chance for repentance or forgiveness. And then he faces the judgment of God, but and as it is appointed unto men, wants to die. But after this, the judgment. Actually, the children of Israel, they should have known, and they found out later in First Chronicles chapter 15. First Chronicles chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 11. First Chronicles chapter 15, verse 11. Here now, after... Uzzah had died and he still wanted to carry the ark into the right place where it ought to be and so now they checked up in the scriptures and they were now going to do the right thing it says in chapter 15 verse 12 and he said unto them ye are the chief of the fathers of the Levites Sanctify yourselves, both ye and your brethren. Sanctify yourselves, both ye and your brethren. We're going to do something important. We're going to do something critical. And this one needs all your heart, all your mind, all your soul. And for you to be sanctified, purified, and submissive to the will of the Lord and the word of God. It says, sanctify yourselves, but ye and your brethren, that ye may bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel unto the place that I have prepared for it. Look at this, number 13, 
For because ye did it not at the first, and you came into the service of God just to serve. You came into the service of God, not thinking of the requirement of the Lord, because she did not have the force. The Lord, our God, made a breach upon us, for that we sought him not after the due order. We did something good, but we didn't do it in a good way. We did something we ought to do, but we did it in such a way that the Lord was not happy with us because we relegated His word, His commandment, His will, His prescription. We relegated that to the background. We thought action was what was necessary. Action without appropriate submission to the word of God. It says in verse 14, So the priests and the Levites sanctify themselves to bring up the ark. They sanctify themselves, they purify themselves, they set apart themselves, their mind, their soul, their spirit, adjusted to the fulfilling of the will of God. They sanctify themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel and the children of the Levites bear the ark of God upon their shoulders. That's what the Lord has commanded, upon their shoulders. Not to have a modern method, a modern approach, a new style, something that just came up, other religious people, they carry their whatever idols and representations of their gods in a cart. Like the Philistines, when they were to carry the air from one place to the other, that's exactly what they did. And they put two moose there, and those two animals were driving, were carrying the ark, and the children of Israel did the same thing. And that is why the anger of God came upon them. But now, after seeking the Lord, after checking up in the word of God, it says the children of the Levites bear the ark of God upon their shoulders with the staves thereon, as Moses commanded according to the word of the Lord. You understand that these Old Testament scriptures are written for our learning. It tells us in Romans chapter 15 verse 4, Romans chapter 15, I'm reading here from verse 4. There's a reason why the Lord has recorded that for us. He wants us to learn from what he did. Wants us to learn from their mistake. Wants us to learn from their repentance. Wants us to learn from their turning around and doing the right thing they ought to do. Romans chapter 15, verse 4. For whatsoever things were reaching aforetime, were reaching for our learning, that we, through the patience and the comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. Whatsoever things were reaching at all time, it's telling us that God's way is not our way. It's telling us that our way, whoever we are, be fall short, will fall short of the way of the Lord. And we are to prefer the way of the Lord, the word of the Lord. The prescription of the Lord. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. A new idea that just came up, a new prescription that just came up, a new perspective that just came up. That's, that's the way of man. But now we're talking about the way of God. It tells us, my ways are not your ways, for the heavens, verse 9, are higher than the earth. So are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. What should we do? We should pray for the grace of God to always follow the word of God. The will of God, the wisdom of God, the prescription of God in everything that we do in our personal lives, in our families, in our places of work, and now in the service of the Lord in the church. I'm looking at Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12 from verse 28. 
Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28, Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace. You see what he wants us to have? The grace to be humble enough to know that my way is not important. Your way is not important. God's way is what's important. God's desire is what's important. God's prescription is what's important. Wherefore, we receive in a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. And now in the New Testament, it tells us the people that tell us that the God of the New Testament is different from the God of the Old Testament. They think the God of the New Testament is an indulgent father. Is the one that smiles at sin. And it doesn't matter what people do. God is always blessing them. Look at this, it says. Look at what happened to them. And look at what can happen to anyone that already gave the word of God to the background and sweep the scriptures under the carpet and just go on in the mind of men, method of men, the wisdom of men. It says, for God is, tell me there, a consuming fire. Tell me out aloud. I want to hear you. For God is a consuming fire. From these scriptures, I'm talking to you on divine prescription for serving God acceptably. Divine prescription for serving God acceptably. We cannot just serve him the way we want. We cannot minister unto him the way we want. We must look at his prescription. Look at his word and look at his demand. And he says, this is the way. Walk ye therein. Well, walk therein in Jesus' name. Divine prescription for serving God acceptably. Three things we're looking at as we consider the passage we read. Number one, the danger of unacceptable consultation without scripture. Consultation without scripture. David made consultation. He asked the people, should we do this? Yes, we should. In fact, it says it seemed right. It seemed good in the eyes of all the people when he made the consultation. But the consultation did not bring in the word of God. The consultation did not bring in the scripture. The consultation did not bring in what has God said, what has God commanded, and what does God demand, and what danger, death, judgment followed consultation without scripture. Point number two is the demand of unwavering consecration was sanctification. He demands that. As we come to worship the Lord, He wants clean hands and a pure heart. As we come to worship the Lord, He wants peace and holiness. As we come to worship the Lord, He puts sanctification before service. And He wants us to understand that we have to sanctify ourselves from all these things that bring defilement and displeasure unto God. And then we serve Him with that consecration and sanctification the demand of unwavering consecration with sanctification. Point number three, deliverance. I pray God will deliver everyone. I want to hear an amen. amen. Deliverance from unbearable consequences of sinful speech. The tongue. The tongue. That tongue can bring a lot of trouble like it brought on Michael the daughter of Saul, the wife of David. God will deliver us from all these unbearable consequences of sinful speech and our life will be prosperous. Our lives will be peaceful. Our life will be profitable. You'll be profitable to God. You'll be profitable to yourself. You'll be profitable to your family. You'll be profitable to the church of the living God in Jesus' name. Point number one. Somebody there tell me point number one. 
the danger of unacceptable consultation without scripture. We're coming to First Chronicles chapter 13. First Chronicles chapter 13. I'm reading here from verse 1. First Chronicles chapter 13, verse 1. And David consulted with the captains of thousands and the captains of hundreds and with every leader, every leader, every leader. David was not doing this all by himself. He knew and he thought that the presence of the ark of God is very important in the nation. And the place that the uh, ark of God ought to say must stay must be a nationally disclosed place. It's not just in the private house of somebody. It must stay in the appropriate place. And so he consulted what the captains, there were captains of hundreds, there were captains of the thousands, all of them together, he consulted with them. And with every leader, look at verse 2, And David said unto all the congregation of Israel, He did not even leave each in the hands of those leaders. He consulted also the whole congregation. If it seemed good unto you, look at this now, look at this now, and that it be of the Lord our God. You know, there are people that bring suggestions. Church, do this. Pastor, go this way. Leaders, go this way. And they think just because they made a suggestion and it appears good, it appears normal. Other churches are doing it. Other places are carrying it out. They do not consider whether that is the will of God for that assembly, for that congregation or not. But you see, even David included, if it be of the Lord our God, he says, let us say in the brush, Unto our brethren everywhere that are led in all the land of Israel. It was uh, something that was going to affect the whole nation. And with them also to the priests and to the Levites, which are in their cities and suburbs, that they may gather themselves unto us. What are we going to do when they are gathered together unto us? Verse 3, it says, and let us bring again the ark of our God to us. For we inquired not at it in the days of Saul. Look at verse 4, and all the congregation said, and all the congregation said, you understand? A thousand of us, ten thousand of us, a million of us, if we're different from what God wants and what he prescribed, a thousand of us, a million of us cannot match God. God is greater than the whole earth. God is greater than all the prophets and the personalities and everyone. Even if everybody agreed, we still have to seek the mind of God and the will of God. All the congregations said that they would do so for the sin was right in the eyes of how many people? All the people right in the hearts and the minds of all the people but you understand in all that consultation they didn't think we should open the scriptures in all that consultation they didn't think we should read what has god commanded when we're to take the ark from one place to the other and so they had consultation without the scripture we're looking at Numbers chapter 4. In Numbers chapter 4, I'm reading here from verse 15. Numbers chapter 4, reading from verse 15. Here he tells us in verse 15, it says, And when Aaron and his sons had made an end of covering the sanctuary, and all the vessels of the sanctuary, as the camp is to set forward, after that, the sons of Kohath shall come to bear it. He's talking about the ark. Shall come to bear it. Not a cat, not a mule, not an, an animal. They should have understood this. But they shall not touch any holy thing. The ark of God was holy, representing the presence of the Lord. They shall not touch any holy thing, lest they die. These things are the burden 
of the sons of Kohath in the tabernacle of the congregation. The warning had been given to them. We're coming to 2 Samuel chapter 6. 2 Samuel chapter 6. And we're reading from verse 6. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, looking at verse 6, it says, And when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uza put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook. The oxen was not to be involved at all in the carrying of the ark. In the moving of the ark, one place to the other, there was no mention of the oxen, the prescription of the Lord in the word of God. And how they came to this, they only learned it from the pagans, from the Gentiles, from the Philistines. And the anger of the Lord in verse 7 was kindled against Uzza, and God smote him. Who smote Uzza? Tell me out aloud. God. When we disobey the word of God, when we dishonor the word of God, when we disregard the word of God and we serve without the scriptures and we consult without the scriptures and we're seeing that the little brain of man is enough to guide the church and guide the presence of God and guide the movement of revival and we do not take scripture in consideration and we say we are wiser than the scriptures, we are better than the scriptures. It brings the judgment of God upon such a people. And God smote him and there for his error. And there he died by the ark of God. Now let's come back to First Chronicles. You are wondering how David could make such a mistake. David was normally a man that sought after the face of God. Anything he wanted to do, wanted to go to battle, God, how should we do this? He wanted to do any other thing, God, should we go, shouldn't we go? What happened to him? We well, read what happened in chapter 13. Let's look at the background now in chapter 12. Chapter 12, First Chronicles chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 32. First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32. And the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times. Not understanding of scripture. Understanding of the times. The age in which they lived. The period in which they lived. The dispensation in which they lived. The history and the things going on in their community. There were these people of Israel, the tribe of Issachar, they had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. They have forgotten the word of God. These people are wise. These people have understanding. These people can direct us right. And it says what Israel ought to do, the heads of them were 200 and all their brethren were at their commandment. All their brethren were now at their commandment. The word of God swept under the carpet. The scriptures neglected, relegated to the background. And these people now were the wisdom, worldly wisdom, were the wisdom, earthly wisdom. With the wisdom, the wisdom that didn't take into account the word of God, that's what now directed the people. But they had been told, look at this in Deuteronomy chapter 12. Deuteronomy chapter 12, I'm reading here from verse 8. How do we take decisions? How do we make progress? How do we do what needs to be done? By going back to the scriptures, consultations, good but not enough somebody in that consultative forum should bring in the scriptures somebody among those people demonstrating wisdom should bring in the bible and tell us look at what the bible says and once the bible has spoken that is final any tribe of Issachar, 
any tribe of knowledgeable people of the times of the land and the politics of the land will keep quiet once the almighty God has spoken through his word in Deuteronomy chapter 12 verse 8 it says ye shall not do after all these things that ye do here this day every man whatsoever is right in his own eyes he said you won't do that again this looks good this looks right it looks profitable and this looks acceptable in the age in which we're living in the period in which we're living god said no it says in verse 9 for ye are not yet come to the rest and to the inheritance which the lord your god giveth you if we're going to inherit what the Lord has promised, we will not do just what is right in our own sight. We will go back to the word of God. We're coming to that uh, same chapter. I'm reading from verse 28. In verse 28, it says, Observe and hear all these words which I command thee, that it may go well with thee. You see, that's what you should have understood. We look at the word of God. Are you serving God? And are you bringing the presence of God, the power of God, and the proclamation of God to the congregation of the people of God? Do it as God has ordained. Do it as God has prescribed. And it says, observe and hear all these words which I command thee, that it may go well with thee, and with thy children after thee forever that thou, when thou doest that which is good and right in the sight of whom? Tell me out aloud. In the sight of the Lord thy God. This look good and right to the captain. Forget about that. This looks good and right to so and so. Forget about that. It must be good it must be right in the sight of the Lord. Verse 32, whatsoever I command you in carrying the ark, whatsoever I command you in worshiping the Lord, whatsoever I command you in serving the Lord, observe to do it. Thou shalt not add thereto, or the wisdom of children of Issachar, Thou shalt not add thereto or the wisdom of the consulting uh, captains. Thou shalt not add thereto, nor diminish from each. What they did looked good to them, but it wasn't right. And sometimes people are like that. They, they want to get married, and they say, what's bad in this? What's bad in that? That's not the right question. The right question is, what has God commanded? What has God commanded? We're looking at chapter 16 of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 25. Proverbs 16, verse 25. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man. There's a way that seemeth right to the captains, to the leaders that uh, David consulted. There's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof, tell me, are the ways of death. It seems right. It seems good. But that's not, the way, that's not the way of the Lord. That's not the way of the scriptures. You know their problem? They didn't bring in the knowledge of the word of God. Wise without the scriptures. Consulting without the scriptures. Counseling without the scriptures. Taking decisions without the scriptures. Carrying the ark, the representation of the presence and the power of God without the scriptures. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 2. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 2. Also, that the soul be without knowledge, it is not good. That the soul be without knowledge, that counselors be without knowledge, that captains be without knowledge, that leaders be without knowledge, that advisors be without knowledge, 
it is not good. And he that hasteth with his feet sinneth in a hurry. When a hurry to take decision, we must do something now. He that hasteth, it must be done now. Because if we don't do it now, what will the people think? What will those other people think? And the people that respected us, if we don't do this now, what will they think about us? And so they're in a hurry, and because they're in a hurry, they have sinned. And when we're sin, then the Bible tells us the wages of sin is death. We're coming to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, I'm reading from verse, from verse 6. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Uza died for lack of knowledge. He had good intention. He had a good motive. And he wanted to serve the Lord. He wasn't thinking about himself. He was thinking about the glory of God. The ark must not fall down. This is the presence of God. It must not fall. But he didn't have the knowledge he ought to have. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. There are some people that can communicate well, they can talk well, they can manage well, they can administer well, but they're ignorant of the word of God. They don't understand the wherewithal, what God has said in his word. And because of that, he says, I'm going to reject them. Because seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I also will forget thy children. Romans chapter 10, we're looking at verse 2. Romans chapter 10, verse 2. Uzzah was zealous, but zeal without knowledge. And of course, David was zealous. Zeal without knowledge. We must do it now. What do you think? We must leave every other thing. Don't leave the reading of the scriptures. Don't leave the interpretation of the scriptures. Don't leave the application of the scriptures. Don't let zeal drive you to spiritual death and to final judgment. We're looking at Romans chapter 10, verse 2. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. They have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. I pray God will help us to remember the knowledge of his word every time in Jesus' name. Hebrews chapter 2, reading from verse 1. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, we ought to give the more honest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we shall let them sleep. We need to give the more honest heed to the word of God, to the instruction of God, to the prescription of God, Anything we're doing, especially now we're coming to the service of God, we come to serve the Lord. We come to present a sacrifice unto the Lord. We must give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest we let them sleep. Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10, we're reading from verse 26. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. For if we sin willfully, after that, we have received the knowledge of the truth. After we hear the word of God, that God demands respect. He demands honor. He demands submission to his word. After we've had that, after we have seen what happened to Uzzah, if we then now go ahead and we'll say, I don't know all that Bible. All I know is that I want to do something, and I want to do it now. And the important thing, I want to look good before the people. I want to be a man of action, a woman of action. If we sin willfully. After that, we have received the knowledge of the truth. There remains no more sacrifice for sin. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment. 
and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' Lord died without mercy. On the two or three witnesses of how much sorrow punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy, who has trodden underfoot the Son of God, and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith it was sanctified an unholy thing, and has done despite unto the Spirit of grace? For we know him that has said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense the Lord, and again the Lord shall judge his people. Verse 31. Everybody, we're going to read this together. One, two, three, go. Verse 31. Can you read that again? Remember, this is New Testament. Can you read that again? It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The people who read all these passages and they still continue in their ways. There's something very clear. They are not born again. When you are born again, you have an honor for God, a desire to glorify God. When you are born again, you want to bury your own selfish will. You want to bury your own selfish desire. You want to say, Lord, I've seen what you require. I've seen what you demand. I want to follow the way of the Lord. And as you follow the way of the Lord, there will be a blessing upon your life. Forgiveness will come. Freedom will come. The peace of God will come on condition you love God so much. You say, Lord, I've been serving you without obeying the scripture. But now I'm going to bring the scripture at the center of my life, at the center of my service, at the center of my sacrifice. I'm going to bring the scripture, the word of God, at the center of my carrying the duty, the responsibility you have given unto me. We're looking at chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 25. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 25. See that she refuse not him that speaketh the word of God, the scriptures. The Lord Almighty himself speaking to us from his word. See that she refuse him not that speaketh. For if they escaped not, who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. David had consultation of captains and leaders of the congregation. The decision was good and right in the eyes of all the people. However, they neglected the scriptures. Their consultation with the old scripture led to the death of Uzzah and the disappointment of Israel and the despair, desolation of their king. One verse of God's word is worth more than all the wisdom of all the men who don't have any submissive heart to the sacred scripture. God's word is greater than all men. Eventually, David realized the error, the sin, the evil, and now they still wanted to carry the ark and bring the ark into the place where it should be. We're coming to point number two now, the demand of unwavering consecration with sanctification. The demand of unwavering consecration with sanctification. We're coming to First Chronicles chapter 15, and I'm reading from verse 11. First Chronicles chapter 15, verse 11. And David called for Zadok and Abiathar, the priest, and for the Levites, for Uriel, Aziah, and Joel, Shemaiah, and Eliel, and Aminadab, and said unto them, Ye are the chief of the fathers of the Levites, sanctify yourselves. We need to carry the ark. It's your duty. But you cannot jump, you cannot jump into responsibility and duty 
sanctify yourselves. He told them, and then he goes on to say, but ye and your brethren, that ye may bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel unto the place that I have prepared for it. For because ye did it not at the first, you didn't sanctify yourself, you didn't purify your souls, you didn't submit to the word, to the will of God, because ye did it not at the first. The Lord our God made a breach upon us, for that we sought him not after the due order. We sought him not after the due order. We must be saved before we can say we're serving the Lord in any area of kingdom service, in the house fellowship, in the women ministry, in the children ministry, in the youth ministry. We're not just calling people that just want to do something. Give them something to do so as to keep them. God did not say that. It says we must be saved. The blind cannot lead the blind. Both of them will fall into the ditch. He said we sought him not after the due order. So the priest and the Levites, what did they do? Verse 14, I said, what did they do? Sanctify themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel. You think of somebody who is going to teach the church of the living God, sanctify yourselves, have the experience you are going to pass across. You're going to talk about repentance. Have you repented? You're going to talk about salvation. Are you saved? You're going to talk about following peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Are you following peace with all men? And are you holy in the sight of the Lord? When well, you bring your gift to the altar, you remember somebody has something against you. Leave your gift at the altar, reconcile. You're going to talk about reconciliation. Have you reconciled with other people? Do you have a saved soul, a cleansed heart, and a heart that is acceptable in the sight of the Lord? Are you sanctified? So the priests and the Levites sanctified themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel. Verse 15, and the children of the Levites bear the ark of God upon their shoulders. The oxen that they used in chapter 13 was still there, but it said, this is not the duty of the oxen. They push your sons aside. The cart was still there, but they push all that aside. Here is the commandment of God. This is the way He wants His work done. Not my way, not your way, but His own way. And it says they carried that ark upon their shoulders with the staves thereon, as Moses commanded, according to the word of the Lord. According to the word of the Lord sanctify yourselves will be sanctified in jesus name if we are really interested in serving the lord that's what you'll do you'll make sure and not only because you're even serving the lord because you want to get to heaven because without holiness no man shall see the lord and we know the trumpet can sound at any time what if you are just serving and serving and carrying this and carrying that and carrying the ark even when you are carrying the ark or the staves as god has prescribed and you are not sanctified what if christ comes at that time where will you spend eternity he wants us sanctified will be sanctified in jesus name we're looking at leviticus chapter 20 Leviticus chapter 20, I'm reading here from verse 7. Leviticus chapter 20 verse 7, sanctify yourselves therefore. You see what has happened to those who are not sanctified? And they try to do the work of God without sanctification. They try to prophesy like Balaam without sanctification. And they tried like Ahithophel to give wisdom to Absalom without sanctification. And they tried to do any area of the work of God without sanctification. It says, therefore sanctify yourselves and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God. And ye shall keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord which sanctify you. On the 
one hand you consecrate yourself on the other hand he himself purifies and sanctifies you verse 26 verse 26 and you shall be holy unto me for i the lord i am holy and have severed you have separated you from other people that you should be mine look up here for a minute you know anything we're doing in the church we have many of those things done in the world for example we have some training and that training did not originate here for example you have in the media like i see cheap we don't have any kind of uh, institution in the church well we can teach all that we learn those things outside but then when we learn the mechanics when we learn the technology when we learn we have the knowledge from there as we now come to use it in the church it's with a sanctified heart a holy heart you know sometimes we, we think about a building architecture and then we have to learn that we don't have any university where they say this is a church university where they teach architecture we learn that outside as you bring that knowledge now you are going to use it for the lord in the church sanctification comes in all the other people that learned it with you in those institutions in the world they go to serve the world and they build whatever they want to build but no sanctification is required there in the church of the living god sanctification comes in now singing and music you understand there is um, you know places where you learn music and the highest kind of music you learn you think about those people while they play it's superb but you see we learn it from them too and as we learn about the trump we don't uh, manufacture trumpets here yeah? we don't manufacture violin or organ or the piano they manufacture over there and the people over there learn how to make use of those things instruments and they do it well they do it well now we learn from them we now come to the church we don't bring their own ideas we don't bring their own mindset into the church everything we have learned if we're going to use it in the church we use it with sanctification sanctification of heart and the lord said i've separated you from the people you will not follow the ideology you will not follow all the things they're doing you know we keep everybody here in order and all that that did not originate here we have you know people in the world where we learn how to control crowd crowd control crowd control we learn that in the world and if the politicians if the president if the governor is going to gather large crowd together there are people that are well trained and they can keep the crowd submissive and sitting down very well we learn from them we learn from them all the techniques and all the methodology there's a way we learn that from them now you bring it to the church you cannot do it the way they're doing it in the world you you understand the methods and all that you bring that sanctification now is on the is at the bottom of everything everything we do in the church even though we learn some of those things from the world we're not bringing sanctification if we do it exactly like they do it in the world with no salvation with no godliness with no sanctification it is not acceptable unto god look at that verse 26 again and ye shall be holy unto me for i the lord am holy and have severed you separated you from other people that ye should be mine i pray god will help us somebody there say god will help you <laughs> second corinthians chapter seven second corinthians chapter seven and i'm reading from verse one second corinthians chapter seven we're reading from verse one having therefore these promises dearly beloved let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. God will perfect you. He will sanctify every one of us so that the service will render to the Lord will be acceptable unto him. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2 
I'm reading from verse 19. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God's son is sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ do what? Depart from iniquity. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, some to honor and some to dishonor. I pray you'll not be to dishonor. Uzzah's service was to dishonor. God felt dishonored. God felt injured. God felt neglected. God felt despised. And because of that, Uzzah came under judgment. The people who are serving, and they think, all I need is to serve. And I come. I'm always available. And I'm going to serve. But you need to ask, are you serving to honor or to dishonor? Are you serving to please God or to displease God? Are you serving in a way that God says, I accept a service? Look at verse 21. If a man therefore... Because he wants to honor God. If a man therefore, because he wants to glorify God, if a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor. Are you the one there? It shall be a vessel unto honor. I said, is this going to be true about you? Sanctified, 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 and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. Verse 22 flee also youthful lusts. You understand? In our service for the Lord, the service brings us together. For example, a choir, that choir practicing and all that, that brings the brothers and sisters together. But understand, if after the practice, if there's some deal familiarity, that is engendering defilement, even in the heart, that service will not be acceptable to God. And the service will render our youth choir, it brings the boys and the girls together. It brings the leaders together with those young sisters and those young brothers. If uh, there is so much familiarity and interaction and you know, whatever it is, and it brings defilement, however good your voice may be, it is no more acceptable unto God. We must keep the holiness and the righteousness and the purity. It says, flee also youthful laws and follow right righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the name of the Lord out of what kind of heart? Out of your pure heart, the Lord will keep you pure. The Lord will keep me pure. Say amen for me now. First Peter, First Peter chapter 1, First Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 14, as obedient children, as obedient children, look up here for a moment. Look at what happened to Uzza. And then the Bible says, it displeased David. David was unhappy. In the church, sometimes there's an Uzza there who has done something wrong. And because the Spirit of God does not want sin to remain in the congregation, is disciplined. And then all the other people now, they are disobedient children. If that happened to Uzzah, it's a colleague. If that happened to Uzzah, it's one of us. If that happened to Uzzah, he had a good intention. If that happened to Uzzah, and uh, we are friends together. If that happened to Uzzah, we're going to defend him to the very edge. Not minding what he has done. Not minding that God is not happy. Not minding that it was God that struck him. Not minding it was the word of God that brought him under discipline. Because of that, so much even say, okay, I will not come to church until they restore Uzzah. Okay, I've not rendered my service until they restored Uzzah. Other people will say, why did that chastisement come upon Uzzah? He touched the earth. Aha, uh -huh, that's exactly what I'm going to do. If they think they want to discipline somebody because he touched the ark, I'm going to see while the pastor is watching, I will touch the ark. That's rebellion. 
and you're not going to get to heaven through rebellion. Whatever your talent and whatever you give, as obedient children, see what God says he doesn't want in his assembly. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to your former laws, the former laws of your ignorance, but as he which has called you is holy. So, be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Verse 16, everybody verse 16, 1, 2, 3, go. Because it is written, not because of deeper life, not because of pastor so-and-so, because it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. You will be holy. Amen. Ephesians chapter 5 Verse 25, Ephesians chapter 5, we're reading from verse 25. It tells us here in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, it says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that ye might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that ye might present it to himself a glorious church, not having sport or equal or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. God will do it for every one of us. First Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Remember in your consultations. Remember, in your administration. Remember, in your people management, the word of God must be at the center. And anything that looks like evil, something that is different from the word of God, abstain from all appearance of evil, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved how blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. He will do it in every one of our lives. There is nothing as important as a salvation to get to heaven. This church was not established just to give us chance to work it's not creating employment it does but that's not the goal the goal is that anyone involved as a member anyone involved as a minister anyone involved as an employee anyone involved in this church will count salvation as number one before my service, before my preaching, before my singing, before my whatever I'm doing, salvation must be at the foundation. There is nothing as important as that salvation. And there's nothing as important as sanctification. God demands salvation before ministry. Look at Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. I'm reading from verse 13. Matthew chapter 15. Reading from verse 13. But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted shall be rooted up. I pray you will not be rooted up. Amen. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, what will happen? Both shall fall into the ditch. If the blind... I just come to demonstrate my talent. I just come to demonstrate my skill. But there's no salvation. And then you're trying to lead, you're trying to inspire, you're trying to encourage, and you're trying to serve the people of God. There must be salvation. Because if you're not saved, you're blind spiritually. And if the blind lead the blind, they both fall into the ditch. God demands sanctification before service. He demands sanctification before soul winning. He demands sanctification before seeking the Lord. He demands sanctification before sacrifice. 
He demands sanctification before giving your substance unto him. Mark chapter 8, verse 36. Mark chapter 8, reading from verse 36. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world? If you minister, if you carry the ark, if you do whatever, and you win, and you gain the applause, the clapping of the whole world, not even of our church alone, of the whole world, whatever you do, and you're exalted, and yet you lose your soul. What does that profit? What shall it profit a man, profit a woman, profit any member? If he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? First Corinthians chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 1. First Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and I'm not charity which comes out of salvation, sanctification. And become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And do I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge? And do I have all the faith so that I could remove mountains and have no charity coming out of salvation and education? I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and do I give my body to be burnt and have not charity, salvation, sanctification, and the love that comes out of that, it profits me nothing. I pray God will give us wisdom. That before any other sin, you make sure salvation is there, you make sure sanctification is there. Proverbs chapter 21. In Proverbs chapter 21, reading from verse 27. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 27. The sacrifice of the wicked is abomination. The service, the deeds, the work, the hell. It says the sacrifice of the wicked is abomination. How much more? When he bringeth it with a wicked mind, not saved, not sanctified, self centered. He says, All that is abomination in the sight of the Lord. He demands unwavering consecration and sanctification in serving the Lord. Point number three deliverance from the consequences. Of sinful speech. We're coming to First Chronicles. In First Chronicles chapter 15. First Chronicles chapter 15. I'm reading from verse 29. First Chronicles chapter 15, verse 29. And it came to pass as the ark of the covenant of the Lord came to the city of David that Michael, the daughter of Saul, looking out at the window, saw King David dancing and playing. And what happened? Tell me out aloud. Say that very well. She despised him in her heart. David did not act according to her expectation. David did not comport himself with the dignity she had painted in her mind. My husband David is the king, and he's so giving to this praising God and giving to serving God that he forgot it should act in a dignifying manner. His heart, his joy, his excitement carried him away. He wasn't even watching that all the people of Israel, even the young people, were looking at him. And then in her own heart, she despised him. You understand, Michael? 
Michael was rendered childless, fruitless because of her tongue. I'll show it to you. She was the beloved wife of David because David endangered his life to get the first king of the Philistines to pay dowry for Michael because he loved her greatly. She could have been the mother of his son that will sit on the throne of Israel. David had other wives, but this was number one. It was the love of his very heart, but her tongue hindered her from fruitfulness. Look at Second Samuel. Second Samuel chapter six. Second Samuel chapter six. You say, why are we learning all this? They are reaching for our learning. Upon whom the ends of the world are come. In your local church, your local pastor is preaching. And then as he's preaching, maybe he didn't pronounce some words the way you expect him to pronounce the words. He didn't stand the way you expect. You have a picture in your mind. You have something in your mind. That's the way my husband ought to minister. What's he acting like that? And then when he's answering question, you are examining everything. And you're sitting there and you despise your husband in your heart. And maybe he's not your husband, you're just a member of the church. And you are there and you think that your pastor, your leader, must act like this and talk like this and keep to this period of time. And if he goes a minute or five minutes beyond your own expectation, you are the overall monitor. And you are the one saying, this is what he ought to do. And this is when he ought to stop. If he appoints somebody in your district to lead such a scripture, and then the fellow he appointed was making some obvious mistakes. You don't even despise the man. It's the pastor who appointed him that in your heart you despise. Even if you didn't say anything, do you know that that can make you fruitless? Even in your place of work, that can hinder the answer to your prayer. Look at this, Second Samuel chapter 6. I'm reading here from verse 16. Second Samuel chapter 6, verse 16. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. And she despised him where? in our heart, even without saying anything. You know, you sit down there. You came to the service to be blessed. You didn't come to the service as a coach, as a leader, as the one as a monitor, as the one to monitor everything going on. You didn't come to the service to control anything. You came to the service to hear the word of the Lord. Speak, Lord, for a servant here is. But as we sat down there from the beginning, you're judging everything, judging everything. And then you have this kind of a weep in your hand. You're going to weep that man psychologically. You're going to weep that person psychologically because you despise him already in your heart. Look at verse 20. Then David returned to bless his household. And Michael daughter of Saul came out to meet David and said, understand, already she, you know, humiliated him in her heart. Already she despised him in her heart. Already she had an ax to grind, something you know, that she wasn't pleased with. And she forgot honor your husband, obey your husband, and she forgot love your husband, she forgot, be a help meet to your husband. And then she said, how gloriously was the king of Israel today who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaids of his servants. That's jealousy. A jealousy. Those ladies were there. 
and as we were dancing and you know before the Lord they could catch your attention they could love you in a way I only should love you and that jealousy now made that to say you, you uncovered yourself today in the eyes of the handmaids of his servants as one of tell me go ahead he said you are shameless think of the wife of the king of the number one person in the nation of Israel saying of vanity you are vain like one of the vain fellows shamelessly covereth himself and David said to Michael it was before the Lord we chose me before thy father a family problem is ensuing here now they talk to me like that and David also said uh-huh your wife didn't dance before the Lord your sorry your father didn't dance before the Lord your father didn't try to any psalm your father didn't ever pray your father didn't ever praise the Lord your father didn't understand the importance of the ark you know Michael threw it at him and he now threw it at Michael and before all his house and to appoint me ruler over the house of the Lord over Israel therefore when I play before the Lord and I will yet be more vile than thus and will be base in mine own sight and of the maid servants which thou hast spoken of of them shall I be at in honor verse 23 we're going to read this together. 23, 1, 2, 3, go. Therefore, Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child unto the day of her death. God restrained her from being fruitful. You see many people with their tongue, they condemn themselves. With their tongue, they destroy their own chances. Many so-called Christians hinder their own prayers with their tongue, hinder their own blessings with their tongue, hinder their own happiness with their tongue, hinder their own progress with their tongue, hinder their own fruitfulness with their tongue. Many so-called Christians hinder spiritual help coming to them with their tongue. Many so-called uh, Christians, even uh, members of a church like this, they hinder their spiritual growth and they hinder their getting to heaven with their tongue. He wants us to surrender our tongues to Christ's control. It tells us in James chapter 3, James chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 5. James chapter 3, we're looking at verse 5. Here it tells us about the problem of the tongue. In verse 5 it says, Even so, the tongue is a little member, and boasts great things. Behold, how great a matter, a little fire kindles, and the tongue is a fire. A world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature. And it is set on the fire of hell. I pray it will not happen to you. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 2. Be not trash with thy mouth. But don't accept any kind of wrong thought in your heart. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Once you despise somebody in your heart, eventually you're going to speak out. And you're going to create trouble and problem, fruitlessness, barrenness for yourself. Be not rash with thy mouth. Let not thy heart be hasty to utter any sin before God. For God is in heaven, 
and thou upon the earth. Therefore, let thy words be few. Look at verse 6. In verse 6, suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Neither say thou before the angel that it was an error. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thy hands. God was angry at Michael for thinking the way she thought about David, praising God, dancing before the Lord, rejoicing before the Lord, and then she despised him in her heart. And eventually when she had a chance to speak, she spoke. And the Lord is saying, don't do that. What are you going to let God be angry with you and destroy the works of your hand? Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 13. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 13. The beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness. What Michael said was foolish. Your husband, if he happens to be the king, if he happens to be the governor of the state, if he happens to be a leader in the church, don't just look at him as your husband. Give him the honor that his office requires. It says, the end of the talk is mischievous madness. A fool also is full of words. A man cannot tell what shall be, or what shall be after him. Who can tell him? Look at this. The labor of the foolish wearies every one of them because he knows not how to go to the city. She forgot how to get to heaven, how to go to the city of God. That's why we're telling God today the Lord will have mercy. The Lord will have mercy on us. Are you there? I said, the Lord will have mercy on us. Look at verse 20 there. Verse 20, curse not the king. No, not in thy thought. That's what she started. She despised him. She was speaking to herself. This man is vain. This one is shameless. And he calls himself the king of the nation. This is terrible. Cost not the king, cost not your leader. No, not in your heart, not in your thoughts. Cost not the rich in thy bedchamber. Don't even talk about David, about the king, or about the pastor, or about your leader in your bedchamber between you and your husband. On the table when you are eating, show the respect that God has shown and put upon David the king. For a bird of the air shall carry thy voice, and that which hath wings shall tell the matter. Job chapter 42, verse 3. Job chapter 42, and I'm reading from verse 3. It says, Who is he that hideth counsel? Without knowledge, therefore have I uttered that I understood not. Michael did not understand spiritual things. There were foolishness to her. And therefore she uttered that she understood not. Things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. It was too great for her to understand. Because of that, she said what she said. Maybe you are like that. And every time you see somebody doing something you don't understand, you don't approve of, it's like, you know, you despise them in your heart. I pray God will deliver us. How will that deliverance come? We're looking at Job chapter 34. Job chapter 34. And I'm reading from verse 31. Job chapter 34, verse 31. Surely it is meet to be said unto God, I have borne chastisement. I will not offend anymore. 
I will not criticize anymore. I will not despise anymore. I will not be careless with my tongue anymore. That which I see not, teach thou me. If I have done iniquity, I will do no more. You didn't say amen to that? Yes. Psalm 139. Psalm 139. I'm reading from verse 23. Psalm 139. Verse 23, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me, lead me in the way everlasting. We bring ourselves before the Lord and we're saying to the Lord, show us where we've gone wrong. Show us where we are denying ourselves of the great blessings we should have. Show us how we have missed the way. And instead of coming to receive blessings from the Lord, we are always judging and despising in our heart. And then we bring fruitlessness upon our lives. It says, try me, O Lord. Search me, O God. See, if there be any wicked way in me like this, forgive me, he will forgive. Amen. Cleanse me, he will cleanse. Lead me, he will lead you in the way everlasting. Once again, blessing will overflow in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord. We've learned a lot today. Let us take all these things to the Lord and say, Lord, where I have done wrong, I will not continue. I come to be blessed, I'm going to be blessed. Open your mouth, talk to the Lord. The blessing is awaiting you before you go.